advanced study. Um, the Institute for Advanced Study for over 20 years has been working to provide support and to facilitate faculty research and creative activity. We've done that in a number of different ways, and one of the ways has been to bring to campus people who we identify as distinguished citizen fellows. These are individuals who've made their marks outside of the academy, but who have a great deal to offer to those of us within. We ask them to come and spend the better part of a week, sometimes two weeks, with us. They attend classes, they meet informally and formally with faculty and students, and they give a public lecture. And of course, it's that public lecture that has brought us out um, this evening. We have tonight a very special distinguished citizen fellow in that he is a native Hoosier, and he has four degrees from Indiana University. He also is going to speak on a topic that I think interests a great many of us. So I'd like to turn things over now to the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who will give a formal introduction. So I'll turn it over to you, Shwami. For those of you who are know where the Dean's office is in Kirkwood Hall, the entrance hallway um, has a gallery of uh, photos. And so I walk through this pantheon of distinguished alumni every day, probably a hundred times. And uh, it's always a great pleasure for me to meet people who's, who are in these pictures and come alive. And uh, uh, Ed Bain is certainly uh, one among them. And it's my distinct pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm working from notes. I obviously just met him, so I couldn't say I've known him all my life or things of that nature. Uh, as uh, uh, you were told, um, he was born in Evansville, Indiana. Hoosier, that's what you heard, but more specifics. Uh, and he learned the value of hard work early when his uh, high school gym teacher would not pass any student who could not run a mile in six minutes <laughs> or under, <laughs> which obviously means that I would never have graduated <laughs> from your high school, and so I'm glad I didn't grow up there. He came to Indiana University, and among his important accompl accomplishments, he met uh, Patricia Graffis one evening in the Commons, it says here. As he said, it, that was it. They were married in Beck Chapel as undergraduates. She completed her degree in three years. And he was a little bit slow, even though he could run a six minute mile. He took three and a half years to complete his BS in business economics in the Kelly School, which was not a Kelly, the Kelly School at that time. So uh, she started on a master's degree. So we're thankful that you took another six months. And then he decided to do an MBA. They both taught with master's degrees at uh, Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, but recognized that uh, they needed to do more and have greater horizons to explore. And so they com came back to IU to complete uh, PhDs. Ed received his in economics and Patricia received her PhD in Spanish and Portuguese. Ed was offered a position in research with the Federal Reserve Bank in Philadelphia, where he rose through the ranks to become president and member of the Federal Open Market Committee for 19 years. And uh, everybody wants to take credit for uh, the wonderful growth in U.S. economy. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I may claim credit as well, why not? <laughs> Uh, but uh, I think most people uh, would uh, give credit to the Fed, of which, um, of course, Alan Greenspan was the head, and uh, Ed was a member of the Federal Open Market Committee. He retired from the uh, Fed last May. Ed has been a valued member of the Philadelphia community, has volunteered his time on several boards, and received many awards for his good works. He also received, as I said, the Distinguished Alumni Award from the College of Arts and Sciences in 1996. We are honored and pleased to have Ed with us for this whole week as a Distinguished Citizen Fellow of the Institute for Advanced Study. It's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Ed to talk about, is the economy in tailspin? No, I mean, uh, that's uh, for the something Republic. Like something that. like something that. Something like that. That's as good a title as any. Well, thank you for um, Thank you for uh, that uh, introduction. It's a good thing that um, I had to 
do that six minute mile. I feel as though I was doing some six minute miles this week as I was uh, running around campus. It's a, it's a long way over there to the uh, Kelly School, uh, Jeff. And then I also had, uh, was back over here at Wiley and I managed to do some things in uh, political science. And it's been uh, really an, uh, an extraordinary week. I have uh, enjoyed uh, uh, every minute of it, really. Uh, I owe a great deal to this uh, university. Uh, I must say the most I owe to it is sitting right there in the form of Pat. We, we were married in Beck Chapel. Actually, by coincidence, our anniversary was this week. And we went into Beck Chapel to the day and almost to the hour. And uh, it was uh, really quite a lot of fun and uh, almost uh, emotionally uh, overwhelming. Uh, but uh, I, the students, I must say, I've been quite impressed uh, with the students uh, here at IU. Uh, they, they seem quite well informed. They've asked uh, very good questions, probing questions. Uh, I've had some uh, classes. Actually, there was a class in this room uh, once, uh, but there were some smaller uh, seminars. And uh, I was in one today in political science for a couple of hours, and the students, uh, some, some doctoral students there, and they really asked some rather penetra penetrating questions. And I think you should uh, be really quite proud of the student body, and I think that uh, you will find that they will, uh, will uh, do things that will make this university uh, very proud. Uh, the faculty uh, as well, I've had a lot of uh, interaction with uh, the economics faculty, uh, the uh, uh, business school faculty, and uh, a couple of people in political science, and I'm, I'm impressed there too. Uh, so um, I think uh, Indiana University is, uh, is, uh, is doing very well, and I think uh, from what I can see, uh, you've got a strong future, and, uh, and uh, the students, uh, your, your product really, I think, uh, are, uh, are, are really quite good. Well, I've uh, talked uh, about a number of topics uh, this week in, uh, in these various uh, uh, classrooms and seminars, but I thought uh, what I would uh, focus on tonight is uh, to uh, first take a longer uh, term view of the remarkable uh, economic expansion the U.S. has experienced over the, the past uh, decade. And then uh, second, to uh, uh, take a shorter uh, term view of the U.S. economy as, as I see it uh, at the moment and uh, what uh, might lie ahead. Uh, in other words, uh, are we headed for a recession in uh, 2001? Or, uh, or aren't we? First, the uh, longer uh, term view. Uh, the U.S. economic expansion over the, the past decade has been truly uh, remarkable. The usual statistical measures of an expansion, uh, length of expansion, as far as we can tell, it's the longest uh, in, in U.S. history. Growth rates, uh, the growth rates have been uh, quite extraordinary compared to the previous uh, 20 years. Uh, job creation uh, has, uh, has really been uh, phenomenal. Unemployment uh, rates are as low as they've been in uh, 30 years. Uh, we've had the lowest inflation rates uh, since uh, the 1960. And when you add it all up, uh, it, uh, it really is a truly exceptional uh, economic performance. Well, how do we make sense uh, out of this uh, kind of remarkable performance? After all, uh, 25 years ago, or 15, or even 10 years ago, the strong, sustained growth in demand the U.S. economy has experienced over the past decade normally would have been expected to cause substantial inflationary pressures, high interest rates, and the onset of recession uh, earlier on. Well, the answer to the question, to that question, in my judgment, is twofold. 
uh, a technology-induced surge in productivity and better economic policy making. Uh, as, uh, as the Dean of Arts and Sciences just indicated, I have spent uh, much of my professional career in the Federal Reserve as a policymaker. And there have been significant changes in the way the Fed makes policy uh, over the last uh, three decades, and all, I think, uh, mostly for the better. The first change uh, is a fundamental acceptance by policymakers of the fact that low inflation is a friend of economic growth, uh, not its enemy. In other words, low inflation and low unemployment go hand in hand, and high and rising inflation usually goes hand in hand with high and rising unemployment. The virtuous cycle of the 1990s, that is, where we indeed have had low inflation and low unemployment, I think is testimony to this uh, proposition, as was the vicious cycle of the 1970s, where, we, in effect, we had accelerating inflation and rising uh, uh, unemployment. The second change has to do with the implementation of a more forward-looking or preemptive monetary policy. A forward-looking policy has a better chance of keeping an expansion on track than a more reactive approach. And we have had several examples during the past 10 years. Uh, in 1994, for example, uh, even before inflation had begun to accelerate, uh, there was uh, building evidence that uh, there was uh, too much demand uh, pressing against supply or that was about to happen. And rather than wait uh, for an economy to overheat, or rather than waiting for inflation to uh, to accelerate, uh, the Fed took preemptive action, uh, raised interest rates, uh, cooled demand, got demand and supply more in sync, uh, and uh, the follow-up from that was a continuation of the expansion uh, that went on for, uh, is still going on, but certainly went on for several years after that. Uh, at the other end of it, uh, in 1998, uh, we uh, had to lower interest rates. In, in the 94 episode, we raised interest rates to, to cool the economy. In 98, uh, with the problems coming out of Southeast Asia, the so-called financial crisis that came from out of that, uh, where we had some uh, uh, seizing up in the marketplace largely because uh, psychology had moved to the uh, to the fear end of the spectrum, extreme fear, and there was uh, a, a, a seizing up of markets. The Fed uh, lowered interest rates and then uh, began to raise interest rates once we got through that period as there uh, was accumulating evidence that we probably were headed toward uh, excess demand in the economy again. Uh, so it has been a, an expansion in which we have s had several episodes of a forward-looking or a preemptive approach to monetary policy that I believe has been uh, helpful uh, at, in keeping this long expansion going uh, while avoiding an accelerating inflation. The third change in the way the Fed has operated uh, has to do with the way outsiders view the Federal Reserve. There is a high level of confidence that the Fed will do its job uh, in a transparent, timely fashion, largely free of political pressure. Confidence, of course, is earned by deeds. A central bank must indeed uh, act in a timely and understandable fashion. And also, the wisdom of letting a central bank operate without political pressure is now more widely appreciated here and abroad. 
The last U.S. administration, for example, generally did not comment on Federal Reserve decisions. This approach, in my judgment, has enabled the Fed to do its job with fewer changes in interest rates than would have been the case in a more politically charged atmosphere, one in which the Fed must act more frequently to demonstrate its independence to a skeptical marketplace. Central banking is about confidence, and confidence is undermined by political interference. And I believe uh, that the new administration will appreciate the, this reality as well. Uh, Bush 1 did not. I think Bush 2 probably will. These changes, uh, commitment to low inflation as a means to more sustainable growth, a forward-looking approach to the, to the implementation of monetary policy, and a high level of confidence that the Fed will do its job uh, have played a major role in sustaining uh, US the U.S. expansion. It is now much more widely perceived uh, that whether the Fed lowers, raises, or keeps interest rates unchanged, the objective is to help keep the expansion on track. In short, the Fed has done uh, a commendable job in helping to keep the U.S. economy on a sustainable growth path, one that avoids both overheating and underperformance. Now, in addition to monetary policy, fiscal policy uh, has also improved in the 1990s. After years and years of government deficits, the federal government is now running surpluses. And in a nation that has low levels of personal savings, government surpluses have made more funds available for productivity-enhancing investments and thus higher standards of living. And going forward, Although some tax reduction and spending increases appear to be in the offing for a mix of reasons, it would still be economically prudent to preserve some surplus rather than see it all dissipate uh, through tax cuts or <coughs> expenditure hikes. Now, better monetary and fiscal policies have been augmented by more deregulation in the U.S. economy. The, ten, the trend towards deregulation in transportation, finance, utilities has made the U.S. more competitive. Also, U.S. labor markets tend to be more flexible than in many European countries, for example, which allows for increasing or decreasing company payrolls more in harmony with market changes. If an employer is able to reduce employment in downtimes, he or she is more inclined to increase them in uptimes. And this flexibility, perhaps counterintuitively, has helped to push the U.S. unemployment rate to its lowest level in decades. Taken together, Changes in monetary, fiscal, and regulatory policy have all been significant contributors to the low unemployment and low inflation that the U.S. has enjoyed in recent years. The most important contributor, in my judgment, to, to U.S. economic performance, however, is the influence that changes in technology have had on productivity growth and hence the capacity of the American economy to produce. We have perhaps been experiencing the greatest advances in technology since the Industrial Revolution. Though all the reasons for the recent improvements in productivity growth are not entirely clear, Certainly, rapid changes in computer, telecommunications, and medical technology have contributed to this development. These new technologies are being implemented in old line companies as well as in new ones at a torrid pace. 
Witness, for example, and there are many examples, but just take Kodak's digital cameras and digital versions of processed pictures. Or consider how businesses are using the internet to place orders for materials and supplies, thereby allowing many companies to reduce the use of paper forms and administrative costs in their purchasing departments. But most of the impetus for the introduction of new technologies has come from newly formed companies that have introduced new products into the market or that provide traditional products or services using new techniques. For example, global positioning systems have allowed companies to trace the delivery of goods and accurately determine their delivery time. The same technology, uh, by the way, has allowed us to quickly find stolen cars. These are examples of things we could not do before. Other companies, however, are simply providing traditional services in a new format. The purchase of books or even clothing over the Internet is just a new and in, many, and in many cases more efficient way of doing what we did before in person, by mail, or by telephone. Whether new venture firms in the U.S. deliver traditional products and services in a new way or provide new products or services, they are increasing our productivity, helping us hold down costs and raising our, our living standards. Well, there have always been new inventions and new ways of doing things. What is different in the U.S. economy today is the fact that we have developed an extensive infra in infrastructure to help entrepreneurs bring new products, services, and processes to the market. This infrastructure uh, consists of, of several elements, and let me mention just a few. First, we have developed mechanisms for financing new ventures. Second, we have developed inst institutions for technical and managerial support of new ventures. And third, we have created the role of the professional entrepreneur in the U.S. economy. And let me elaborate about each of these elements of this entrepreneurial infrastructure. First, the financial element. Startup firms in untested markets are not good candidates for direct financing from commercial banks. This is especially true for service firms uh, uh, that often have few or no tangible assets. So startup firms normally get their financing from wealthy individuals, appropriately called angels, or from venture capital funds whose major sources of money are pension funds, insurance companies, and university endowments. Venture funds and angels look for startups that have a very high expected rate of return because they know that some will inevitably fail. The funds expect to cash in on their investment in new companies in about five years either by selling the company to a larger firm or through an initial public offering. The relative success of these initial public offerings uh, gives investors some idea of the quality of the venture capital firm. The more than $6 billion in new funds committed annually to venture capital funds in the U.S. in recent years is small compared with the total amount spent on research and development. But the amount of venture capital was less than a billion dollars annually before 1979, and it has doubled since the 1980s. Moreover, the venture uh, fund industry has had a disproportionate effect on innovation in the U.S. economy. A second element in the entrepreneurial infrastructure in the U.S. is the institutions that provide technical and managerial support. 
The two major institutions that provide this kind of support are small business development centers and business incubators. At the prompting of the Small Business Administration, 10 business schools at universities on the East Coast uh, started small business development centers in 1980. These centers are designed to give technical, managerial, and financial advice to small business owners, and they draw on the expertise of various members of the university. From the original 10 small business development centers in 1980, their number has grown to more than 900. Business incubators offer some of the same resources as small business development centers. In addition, startup companies are often housed in a business incubator and often share some services such as secretarial help, copy centers, and conference facilities. These incubators are most often sponsored by state and local government and nonprofit organizations. The University City Science Center uh, in Philadelphia, for example, which was founded in, 19, in the 1960s, was one of the earliest business incubators. It is owned by a group of 30 or so academic and scientific institutions. The center has launched more than 215 successful startup organizations. Nationally, the number of business incubators has grown from 12 in 1980 to about 600 today. A third element in the development of an infrastructure for entrepreneurship in the U.S. has been the emergence of the professional entrepreneur. Thirty or forty years ago, when someone had a new idea or invention, he or she might have founded a company, seen it grow to maturity, and remained CEO for the rest of his or her career before leaving it to the children who squandered it. <laughs> uh, today, we are seeing uh, more and more people who start one company, sell it after a number of years, and then start another company and perhaps several more. They are, in effect, professional entrepreneurs. These individuals are willing to take a substantial amount of risk to start up a, a new enterprise because of the potential rewards not only in terms of their annual salaries, but also in various types of incentive pay, such as bonuses and stock options. American entrepreneurs also get encouragement and support in a number of other ways. There are a number of journals and magazines devoted to entrepreneurship and several hundred colleges and universities in the U.S. offer courses in entrepreneurship. Around the U.S., a variety of organizations have been formed at the local level to provide entrepreneurs with opportunities to obtain advice. The Philadelphia Fed, as an example, uh, hosts the monthly meetings of entrepreneurs forums that bring together entrepreneurs and service providers to, to discuss common issues. Now let me caution that development of this entrepreneurial infrastructure in the U.S. economy has not eliminated the risk of new ventures. It has simply made it easier for more people to take that risk. A few numbers illustrate this point. In 1997, there were more than 160,000 business startups in the U.S., but there were also more than 80,000 failures. Each year, Inc. Magazine publishes a list of the 500 fastest growing privately owned uh, companies in the U.S. Of the 500 companies on the list in 1985, almost 20 percent had disappeared or failed by 1995. 
The competitive marketplace continues to perform its role of testing new ideas and products. The new infrastructure for entrepreneurship does not eliminate that test. It simply allows more new companies to take the test. I might add that the emergence in recent years of this entrepreneurial infrastructure in the U.S. has occurred against the background of a long-standing cultural characteristic that values risk-taking. Risk-taking involves both successes and failures, and both are taken in stride in American, more in, in stride in American society than in some others. Many, if not most, entrepreneurs experience failures along the way to success. One success can erase the memories of many failures, and the rewards of one success can easily compensate for the losses of numerous failures. The point is that failure in an entrepreneurial setting should not be viewed personally or in isolation, but rather as part of the process of trying out various ideas, of which only a few will prove to be uh, commercially uh, successful. And the, this cultural uh, uh, characteristic in the United States of willing to take risk is not shared in many other uh, uh, cultures. Uh, I've spoken a number of times overseas. We've talked about entrepreneurship in these countries, and it is very difficult in a society that views risk-taking differently or views risk-taking as a personal uh, failure. To sum up the longer-term view of the economy, uh, the remarkable performance of the U.S. economy over the last decade has occurred largely because of the fortuitous coming together of improved economic policies and the introduction of new technologies into old line as well as new economy companies. The introduction of new technologies has been facilitated by an entrepreneurial spirit that views risk-taking positively and an entrepreneurial infrastructure that allowed more people to engage in risk-taking. The combination of better economic policies and new technologies has allowed the U.S. economy to grow much faster than previously thought without setting off an inflationary spiral, and the result has been higher standards of living. Some of us in this room have lived long enough to know, however, that economic expansions do not last forever. Even with better economic policies and rapid changes in technology, something will go wrong at some point and the long U.S. economic expansion will end. Perhaps the risk-taking will get out of hand and major excesses will occur. Perhaps there will be a serious policy mistake or perhaps there will be an unanticipated shock that crushes confidence. You can pick your own showstopper from the list of possibilities, which brings me to the second part of my lecture, a closer look at the current state of the U.S. economy. Starting in 1999 and continuing into the first half of 2000, the Fed engaged in a series of tightening moves. The objective like 1994, was to preserve the expansion by preventing an overheating of the economy. In more technical terms, to moderate the growth in aggregate demand to a rate more consistent with the growth in aggregate supply. Although this process may look precise in economic models, it still requires a hefty dose of judgment as to timing and magnitude of tightening. And there is accumulating evidence in recent months that the pace of the economy indeed is slowing and attitudes about the economy have turned more pessimistic after several years of hyper-optimism. 
American consumers whose spending accounts for two-thirds of GDP have curtailed their buying, including their buying of discretionary items such as jewelry and airline tickets, as well as big ticket items like cars, houses, and PCs. Rising energy prices and higher debt loads are holding back low and moderate income consumers. Falling equity prices have affected higher income buyers. As sales have moderated, inventories have risen, and businesses have cut back production. As a consequence, manufacturing is down, layoffs have risen, and consumer confidence has eroded, although unemployment still remains low. Businesses, uh, business has also scaled back spending for new equipment, one of the mainstays of the expansion in the face of weaker sales, shrinking earnings, and tighter credit. The result is that the economy is growing well under uh, the pace of a year ago and isn't really growing much at all. And the question is, are we headed for a recession after 10 years of expansion? A recession is certainly possible. The economy could spiral downward uh, or some shock such as a major bankruptcy or an outsized spiking of energy prices could push the economy over the edge. The margin for error when the economy is growing one or two percent is certainly less than when it is growing five or six percent. And psychologically, the economy may feel like it is in a recession with such a sharp deceleration in growth. The most likely outcome, however, is that the economy will continue to grow, albeit slowly for several quarters, before gaining strength during the second half of the year, uh, thus avoiding an actual recession. And, and I think most people think of a recession as two quarters or more of negative growth. There's nothing really official about that, but that's kind of the conventional wisdom. Now, there are several reasons why I believe a recession looks unlikely. The first is that consumer spending is likely to continue to grow because wages and salaries will continue to grow, even if unemployment does rise, which it most certainly will. The bulk of consumer spending is for the basics of life rather than the discretionary luxuries of life. And routine consumer spending acts as a powerful shock absorber uh, in a weakening economy. Second, interest rates have come down and almost surely will come down further in the coming weeks and months, providing another shock absorber. The Fed raised interest rates to avoid a boom and they are lowering interest rates to avoid a bust. Third, business spending on new equipment is likely to continue to grow in 2001, although much more slowly, but it will still help prop up the economy. Stronger companies are likely to take advantage of periods like this to strengthen their competitive position, while their weaker competitors are forced to cut back sharply. So the bottom line uh, for the economy is, is that consumer and business spending are slowing, but not falling out of bed, and interest rates are coming down uh, to help avoid a recession. Now let me close with several thoughts about financial markets. What happens in financial markets is determined by an ever-changing mix of fundamentals and psychology. Ultimately, fundamentals prevail, but psychology can delay and exaggerate the influence of fundamentals. In equity markets, the primary fundamental now is that the economy is slowing along with corporate earnings. The economy has slowed so rapidly that economies have had, uh, that companies have had to repeatedly adjust earnings estimates downward. 
the market, the, the, the marketplace, the equity marketplace, is groping for an accurate estimate of earnings so that it can appropriately price share value. The heightened uncertainty about the outlook for the economy and earnings is weighing heavily on market psychology. And until there is a higher level of confidence in the outlook for the economy and corporate earnings, equity markets are likely to remain volatile as they seek a bottom uh, before uh, trending upward. In fixed income markets, the primary fundamental currently is concern about credit quality. The result is very high uh, junk bond yields and low yields for high quality securities like uh, U.S. Treasuries uh, securities. And I might add you see this uh, concern about credit quality in, uh, in shorter term markets like commercial paper as well. Anxiety about possible defaults and bankruptcies is weighing heavily uh, on the on the psychology of fixed income market participants. In the current environment, the major risk to both markets, equity and fixed income, is a surprise development or shock that causes uncertainty to turn into irrational fear with spillover damage to the economy. How should monetary policy makers deal with this risk in financial markets? Fortunately, the same way they are dealing with downside risk to the, low to the real economy by lowering interest rates. And that is an important reason why futures markets have a near 100% probability of more rate reductions uh, to come. So, even though the U.S. economy has had a lengthy run of prosperity and the outlook is basically positive, the immediate period ahead has its risks and challenges. I first learned about these risks and challenges here at IU. Uh, the faculty stimulated my intellect and for that I am forever grateful. For those of you who are currently students, the path from here can be as productive and satisfying as you choose. You will, live, you will leave here intellectually equipped to achieve much. I'll stop there and I'll open myself up to uh, the questions. Thank you. Board income tax cut help? Well, um, I, uh, I don't think that I would uh, be out front and advocating it. I'm not sure it, uh, it offends me so much that I would, uh, would really oppose it. I think the, uh, the uh, tax cut train is uh, is leaving the station, um, and I think as my former colleague uh, Alan Greenspan uh, said uh, today, he didn't use these words, but I think he said I'd rather be on the train and try to help uh, decide where it goes than be in front of it where I probably can't stop it anyway. There are, um, there are uh, uh, three things you can do with a, a deficit. You can uh, pay down the debt, which is another way of, of uh, in effect, using government uh, surplus, a kind of government savings to offset uh, personal, the, the, uh, the shortage of uh, personal savings in the United States. That is a priority. That's, I would give a priority to that uh, for, for a while anyway. The second thing is you can uh, cut taxes. The third thing is you can raise uh, expenditures. Um, I think given the size of the tax cut, there's, there is uh, room to do uh, some of all three. 
I don't think that uh, lowering taxes, however, is going to do very much uh, one way or the other to either avoid a, a recession or not. I think that uh, even under uh, the best of circumstances, it will probably take uh, till the spring or summer for a tax cut to, to get through. I mean, look, the admin new administration has to get its own act together has to get through the House, it has to get through the Senate, they'll undoubtedly have different versions, they'll have to have a, a conference committee try to work it out. It won't be what the administration wants, the administration will threaten a veto, uh, and you're going to have to work all the way through that, so by the time a tax cut gets through, uh, the economy will probably be well on its way toward recovery. So I don't see it as, an, as a counter-cyclical tool. I think you can uh, argue that uh, uh, on philosophical grounds, well, we had uh, tax increases in, during Bush 1 and Clinton to try to, to uh, reduce the deficit. We've, re we've got a surplus now, so maybe some of that ought to go back. You can make some supply side arguments that if you lower marginal rates that it will act as an incentive. And we certainly do have some anomalies in the tax code. I mean, uh, uh, I'm going to stay married no matter what the marriage penalty is, but I, I mean, you can argue, I suppose, that uh, society shouldn't uh, penalize with the tax system at least some marriages. So I think you can argue, uh, I think you can argue uh, I think you can argue and make a case for tax cuts. Uh, and uh, as I say, I don't think I'd be out front with those arguments, but uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not overly offended as an economist as long as uh, when the Congress and the administration are, are through with it that there's at least some surplus remaining to, uh, to try to add to uh, national savings. Yes, Jeff. Uh, Ed, in looking back at the prosperity of the 1990s, uh, what role, if any, do you put the, the breakup of the old Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War and the conversion from a larger defense establishment to a smaller defense establishment? Oh, I think that that undoubtedly uh, has played a role. I don't know quite how to uh, measure that. Uh, it may be playing a larger role in Europe than it is in the United States because I think uh, uh, it has enabled uh, uh, East Europe and West Europe have got a much broader market. I think that uh, Europe is now much more focused on economic integration. Uh, probably would not have been able to uh, do that to the degree that uh, they've been able to do it had the Soviet Union uh, uh, remained a, a threat to, uh, to them, uh, a perceived threat, actual threat. Uh, so I think uh, I, I would uh, say that it's, it has helped Europe more. It undoubtedly has helped the U.S. some because uh, one doesn't have to have the, the same level of, uh, of military uh, uh, expenditures. Um, uh, sure, you could put that on the list of reasons. It's not one that I mentioned, but I, I grant you, I think it, I think it contributes. Yes? You seem to take the low savings rate as a given. Is there serious work being done with respect to what happens when the baby boomers age or other uh, demographic reforms. Well, yeah. If they change this, and what would be the effect of yeah. that on the things that <clears throat> You know, you're quite right uh, that uh, one would expect that uh, as the baby boom ages that uh, we would see an improvement in the savings rate. Uh, we haven't seen uh, all that much of it yet, but I think it's a reasonable kind of projection. Uh, but we have so far to go have to have really quite a quite a lot of improvement, uh, and uh, I think that uh, sooner or later, I think that uh, that our 
dependency on uh, on imported capital uh, is uh, it is a longer term vulnerability for the for the U.S. economy, uh, but you would expect the savings rate to rise, and if it does, and at the same time the uh, the federal uh, surplus uh, shrinks, uh, maybe that's about all one about all mortals can ask for. But, but sure, I mean, I I don't think it's a, a given, you know, going out uh, for ten or twenty years. But it certainly, I think, is is uh, is an issue currently, and I don't see it uh, uh, abruptly rising. I hope that is wrong, but I. Have you been doing some research that would suggest that otherwise? No. Well, if you can find it, <laughs> I'd like to know about it. Because I think it would be good. Well, I wondered when you'd get into the afternoon. <laughs> Go ahead. I didn't want to leave without any more criticism. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Come on. I know he's got about three of them here. And he's got them. First, first, the multifactor. One is uh, is the talk about in inflation within the Federal Open Market Committee dead. And one, the second question related to that is, is there more unanimity now within the Open Market Committee or within Federal Reserve Presidents than there was uh, a year ago. We know who the inflation hawks were. We know we know the, uh, uh, the St. Louis Bank and we know the uh, the uh, uh, Cleveland Bank and, and and we know that it's ter terrible for Richmond because he was I think that uh, everybody uh, on the Open Market Committee believes that it's absolutely essential to keep uh, the rate of inflation uh, down uh, to a level that it does not significantly impact uh, economic uh, decision making. I think there is an absolute commitment on the part of everyone uh, in the, on the committee. I think, however, where the difference is, is that in recent years, uh, I think that there have been some members of the Open Market Committee, including me, who have been willing to uh, take, take some risk on this new economy, that indeed we do have, we do have the greater growth potential and to kind of feel our way. And I think that that has turned out to be a, a, a reasonable risk. However, I was speaking for myself, it would not have taken much in terms of acceleration of inflation uh, for me to back off that. But it, it just seemed to me uh, and others on the committee that uh, it was worth taking the chance on. And I think that it, uh, I think that it paid off. If we hadn't taken a chance on it, we'd still be thinking that growth in the U.S. was 2.5% uh, or 3%, and maybe you couldn't get the unemployment rate down much below 5 or 6%. I think that if, if there are any indications uh, that, uh, that uh, inflationary pressures are picking up, I think you would very rapidly see the open market take a, a chance. I don't know where Al Broadus went wrong. He was your student more than I was. Now, what do you think he... He came into the wrong hands. He came into the wrong hands, <laughs> that's right. No, actually, the differences on the, among members of the Open Market Committee, more are made of those differences uh, than, uh, than uh, what I think deserves uh, to be. I remember a very well-known journalist came to me, a very well-known newspaper, 
and he said, my editor wants me to write a story about how you guys beat up on each other. And he said, I follow the Fed long enough to know that your differences are such that you can work them all out as ladies and gentlemen. He said, I want a direct quote from you so I can take it back to my editor that you don't have a slugfest. And I think that's right. The way journalism is, is that uh, it's no fun to say that reasonable people sit down and uh, work things out and if there are differences, they work them out like ladies and gentlemen. That's not newsworthy. What is newsworthy is, is that there are big fights. And, uh, in the Fed, there are uh, hawks and doves and governors versus presidents uh, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But the difference is really all that great. I would say maybe some people are a little more sensitive as to how they might come across in the press than others, but then that's human nature. Yes. Yes. 